to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 16 through 24 is what we're looking at today. We're doing this series through 2 Corinthians called Perfecting Holiness, and the whole verse is perfecting holiness in a fear of God, and it's just a powerful look at uh, the ministry of the gospel that Paul is preaching around the world at this time, but specifically ministering to a church who's not unlike most churches. This church that's gone through a lot of issues, gone through a lot of issues with the tissues, as we say in the church sometimes. There's flesh issues going on. We all have these problems with our flesh getting in the way. You know, our spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, right? And, uh, and so there needs to be some corrections along the way. And out of the whole New Testament, you'd have to say that the Corinthian church is the one that gets rebuked the most. Uh, because of the issues they have going on. But, praise the Lord, uh, you know, just like in, in life, uh, the Lord deals with us about those things, and then we repent of those things, we confess that sin, and we move on, and then we're able to serve the Lord. And that's where we are in the book now, as this Corinthian church has dealt with their sin, they've repented, and, and now Paul is calling them to serve in a more powerful way than what they have in the past. Now that they've dealt with issues, now they're able to now go out and uh, be used by the Lord uh, to serve and, and care for the needs of other churches, in particular, the churches that are down in Israel, in Jerusalem, that are dealing with uh, the poverty uh, of what's going on down there at this point. And so this church is uh, just coming and ministering to them. And so we've really kind of started a, a three-part series here last week entitled The Proof of Love. Proof of love, because again, we can talk about love, we can, we can study uh, aspects of love in the Bible, we can study aspects of our faith, we can study theology, we can talk about it, talk about it until we're blue in the face, but when the rubber meets the road, how do we actually go out and uh, put our faith into action? How do we actually go out and prove that we love people in the name of Jesus Christ? And, and Paul is saying, I want you to prove this love to these poor churches down there. We're taking up an offering and we're going to take it down there to them. You uh, Corinthian churches have volunteered to do that last year, and that was good. You had a readiness of mind to do it, but we haven't really taken up that offering yet. And so, you know, as a result, chapter 8 and chapter 9 of the book of 2 Corinthians become the greatest passage about giving in the name of Jesus Christ in the whole Bible. And, uh, and so it, as, a, as a, a result, it's a good thing to just really study that subject. It's not a subject we like to talk about a whole lot, uh, you know, in the church. You know, we don't like to talk about giving and certainly sacrificial giving and those kind of things. Some churches do. This church, we don't. <laughs> we don't uh, make a big issue of money. Uh, uh, and, and so we do that because of the passages that we read here in 2 Corinthians that it shouldn't be something that you talk about a whole lot, but it's something of the heart. And so uh, love in your heart uh, oftentimes is proved by your actions. And, uh, and Paul is giving us a great master study about that right now. And so again, take out your Bibles and, and follow me along, follow along with me there in verse 16, where it says, but thanks be to God, who puts the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus. For he not only accepted the exhortation, but being more diligent, he went to you of his own accord. And we, having sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches, and not only that, but who was also chosen by the churches to travel with us with this gift which is administered by us to the glory of the Lord himself to show your ready mind. Avoiding this, that anyone should blame us in this lavish gift, which is administered by us, providing honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have often proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent because of the great confidence which we have in you. If anyone inquires about Titus, 
he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you, or if our brethren are inquired about, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. Therefore, show to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for another opportunity to come and study it and come and read it, come and talk about it. But Father, we also know that the proof of our love is in our actions. And so, Father, today that you would stir our hearts, Lord, that you would uh, empower us to have the courage to go out and walk out our faith on a day-to-day -day basis in this dark world that we live in right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Proof of love. Uh, well, I've really enjoyed this kind of mini-series that we're doing in the midst of a bigger series. Uh, it's kind of an interesting thing that you see within uh, aspects of Scripture. And uh, I think it's very powerful what Paul is dealing with here in these two chapters. And so I thought it was nice to, to combine it together in one concept. But um, some key words that I saw in this passage that are just really standing out, you see the word diligent over and over and over again in this passage, and then the idea of, of people who are chosen within the ministry to go out and do the ministry based on uh, you know, the diligence that has been seen in them in the past. And so um, what it really you know, deals with you know, in this passage that we're dealing with is the actual act of taking that gift and taking it down to Jerusalem and making sure that they receive that money to help out the, the poor churches in Jerusalem. And so there's a lot going on here. There are a couple of people, there are three people who have been chosen to, to do this mission. And uh, the sacrifice that they're involved in, you know, it doesn't come right out and say it, but you think about traveling 800 miles with a large gift of cash in the ancient Roman world, you know, you're really putting your life on the line there. And, uh, and so these people are doing it though of their own accord, it says. And so there's a lot of things that we can talk about as far as diligence in the ministry. And I, I found it to be um, a, a great subject. You know, I, I find in the church today, there is kind of a lack of a diligence a lot of times. Uh, as people come and they want to get involved, but then that... That desire to serve kind of goes away very quickly. You know, they maybe volunteer for something, and then, uh, you know, before you know it, you never see them again, and those kind of things. And I think within the heart of a believer, you know, the way that we uh, exercise our faith is the diligence that we show. You know, we're going to look at a few verses here today that deal with that idea, but Jesus himself said, look, if you're faithful in the little things, you're going to be faithful in the big things. And so there is a, an element to our faith about walking out this faith that is the idea of being diligent. And, uh, and then you're given more responsibility to, to carry out the Lord's work. And so chosen and diligent are the two things we'll look at here today. Um, uh, the, the idea of proof of love, of course, is in that verse 24. We looked at it last week there. But therefore show to them, the churches down there in Jerusalem, and before the churches... The proof of your love, the proof of your love, actually taking that, uh, that gift down to them. <clears throat> a good example of that, I think, is the Salvation Army. You know, great example of, of doing God's work in the sense of helping people and, and caring for the needs of people while at the same time ministering the gospel to them. And uh, they were just really one of the icons of, uh, of the church movements back in the 19th century of of people who would go out and, and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and at the same time help people in, in dire uh, situations of need. And uh, William Booth, the guy on the left there, I love that beard. I think I'm going to do that. What do you think, honey? Just let him just... Maybe not. <clears throat> but he said about faith and works, because that's really, really what we're talking about here. Faith and works should travel side by side. Step answering to step like the legs of a man walking. First, first faith, and then works, and then faith again, and then works again until they can scarcely distinguish between uh, which is the one and which is the other. And I, I think that's a good way of looking at it. You know, uh, we talk about faith and talk about faith again, uh, and, and in the church today, that's kind of what we do. Uh, a lot of times, we're just talking about our faith. 
and we're not acting out our faith enough? What is the proof of the faith that we have within us? Of course, that is done in the actions. And probably no point in the Bible uh, that makes that uh, more clear than James. James chapter 2, verse 14 through 20. Uh, he says there, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or a sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed, be filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? You're just saying words. Paul would say at another point, you know, you're just a clanging symbol. You're just making noise. If you don't have love that really does something, you're just talking. You're just making noise. And so he goes on there. He says, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Uh, then in verse uh, 18, I think it is. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And isn't that a powerful statement that he's making there? I'll show you that I have faith. I'll show you the proof of my love by my actions and actually carrying out and, and working out my faith. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Faith without works is dead. Very famous passage of scripture. Mm -hmm. And of course, some people can take that to the, to the wrong uh, degree on the other side. And that's all they do is works, you know, good works. It's kind of, uh, um, what's the little old nun's name? Um, Mother, Mother, Teresa. Mother Teresa kind of a ministry. It's a very humanistic ministry. Mother Teresa made the statement one time, I never try to convert people to Jesus Christ. I just want to care for their needs. That's a very humanistic kind of a thing. If you're not going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them and care for their eternal souls, uh, you're just keeping them comfortable until they go to hell, essentially. And so there has to be both. The other side is, you know, we can't just do works for our salvation. I got to keep doing stuff to make God happy, then he'll let me into heaven. Then I can be granted salvation if I work hard enough. No, it's not that either. You come to faith uh, and, and gain salvation by your faith in Jesus Christ, and he pours out his grace upon you as a result of your faith in Jesus. But then from that point on, you know, this idea of works comes in. You say you have faith in Jesus, but you don't really care for anybody else but yourself. You only want to take care of the needs that you have. You're not caring about anyone else. And so there is a balance there to be sure that we don't want to get on a works kick. But at the same time, uh, in the passage we're dealing with today, we want to show that we have faith. We want to show that we have uh, a true faith, a genuine faith. And so as we go back and look at those verses together, Paul says in the, the verse 16 there, uh, the first word is but. And of course, when we start with a but, we have to wonder, what was he talking about? Well, last week, remember, we were talking about being willing and able to give, you know, and he dealt with that subject in verse 14. He said, uh, uh, by an equality that now at this time, your abundance may supply their lack and their abundance may also uh also may supply your lack someday. Someday you're going to need some help, and maybe they're going to be able to help you when you're in a bad situation. And so there needs to be an equality between those churches. As it is written, he who gathered much had nothing left over. He who gathered little had no lack. And so, uh, and then he says, but thanks be to God, who puts the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus. Now, Titus is a pastor. Not at this point, but he will become a pastor someday. That's why we have the pastoral epistles, uh, two to Timothy and one to Pastor Titus. Uh, Titus is a guy who has a like-mindedness with Paul. He's traveling around with Paul. He's learning from Paul, and eventually he goes on to pastor his own churches, uh, starting out in Crete, and, and, and then we don't know a whole lot more about his ministry after that. But uh, certainly 
Uh, Paul calls him in that, that letter of Titus uh, uh, a son to him in the faith. And so Paul has led this young man to faith. And now this man is, is, has the same kind of heart of care for the people that Paul does. And, and Paul is just saying, thanks be to God uh, for this man Titus who's coming to you, who has been given the same heart of love for you, the, a pastor's heart. And so he has this desire to help out. And, and so you see Titus going all over the place. Paul's going all over the place and, and they're writing letters to each other. Hey, make sure you get down over to that church and take them that money. And, you know, he's helping out. But, but Titus has that same kind of care for the people and just wants to be used by the Lord in a powerful way. And so Paul's just giving thanks for that idea there. For he not only accepted the exhortation, but being more diligent, he went to you on his own accord. Twice he's going to go down there. Uh, the first time he went down there to see if that church had received Paul's first letter, that letter of kind of a rebuke about their sin, but then to find out had they received it and repented themselves or are they still in that place of sin? And then Titus comes back to Paul and says, yeah, they're good. They're, they've repented of the sin and uh, they're ready to serve the Lord. And, uh, and now Titus is going to go down again and receive that gift and take it down to uh, Jerusalem. And so it's a diligence that Paul begins to talk about here. And again, I think diligence is so important in the ministry. If you're going to serve the Lord, you better come to a place of just saying, Lord, I am yours. Use me in any way you see fit and give me a spirit of diligence. Give me a heart of love for your people so I can care for their needs. I remember so clearly Pastor Chuck, the uh, founder of Calvary Chapels, he used to talk about, you know, he'd go out in the parking lot and he'd be cleaning up, you know, and he, he'd have a, you know, a bad attitude about it. And, uh, you know, he'd be looking around the parking lot and finding cups and cigarette butts and, you know, all this trash in the parking lot. And he'd have to pick it up himself after a Sunday service. And he said one day, you know, I was just out there, I oh, can't believe these people are just so filthy and dirt. You know, he's just really griping about it. And uh, he said the Lord spoke to his heart right at that moment and said, who are you serving, the people or are you serving me? And Pastor Chuck was really convicted, you know, about that. And as a result, he repented of that sin and he recommitted himself to the Lord and said, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do and, you know, please forgive me of that. And, and from that point forward, God just gave him a heart of love for the people, a heart to just forgive and uh, overlook those kind of things and not worry about those things, knowing he's serving the Lord. And uh, as unto the Lord is, is the key phrase that we find in Scripture. Are you doing it to look good in front of people? Are you doing it for your own personal desire to be up in front of people or to be seen by people as being spiritual? What is your motivation? Well, it better be as unto the Lord. I'm doing this as unto the Lord. And if you're doing it as unto the Lord, you better be diligent about it. And, and when you begin to make that kind of sacrifice, the Lord begins to work in your heart and give you a heart of diligence if you're willing to. And so it's uh, very important as we serve the Lord. Now, I'm not just talking about pastors here. I'm not talking about assistant pastors, worship leaders, any of that kind of stuff. If you serve the Lord in any way, if you want to be used by the Lord in any way, do it with diligence as unto the Lord. And so in this passage, we find three people who are set aside, pulled out, uh, seen as uh, you know, just diligent people that are wanting to be used by the Lord and, and therefore they are chosen to take this gift down to Jerusalem. And so it's a, a great um, exhortation for us, I think, uh, to be diligent as we serve the Lord and uh, not worry too much about uh, how it makes me look or anything like that. Well, of course, that involves character. As someone has said, God is more concerned about our character than our comfort his goal is not to pamper us physically, but to perfect us spiritually. 
And I think that is so true. A lot of times we, we think that, uh, you know, God is just supposed to take care of every one of our little needs and, and pamper us and really make us feel good all the time. And, and there's no issues going on in my life. And, and God's taking care of all the bad things. No, not at all. God is using those things in your life to perfect you spiritually. And be thankful for those things. Be thankful for the trials that you go through. Be thankful for the hard things that you endure because it's building character in your heart. It's building diligence in your heart. And those things are going to be needed, I think, very much so in the coming years as we start to see our country falling apart. As we start to see our country just becoming, uh, you know, crazy, insane, the things that we see happening. We start to see our country is becoming less and less of a godly nation. Less and less of a, a nation that adheres to scripture or even knows anything about scripture. And as a result, the immorality and, and all the other wickedness is going through the roof. And so we need to begin to build this character, build this diligence into our hearts and into our lives because we're going to need it as time goes on. I really believe that to be true. And so he goes on there, he said, and we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And that's kind of a, a weird wording there, but he's kind of saying there's another guy that we're going to send with this package, this gift. And, you know, his praiseworthiness, the thing we praise about him, is his diligence in the gospel. What is he? He's an evangelist. And everybody, all the churches know him. Why? Because he's traveling around getting people saved and helping plant churches and, and doing all these kind of things. And as a result, people know him uh, because of his passion for preaching God's word to a lost and dying world. And, uh, and that's where we find his diligence is his passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And again, as we go on, you know, it used to be that uh, Christianity was kind of the, the dominant religion of our country. And, uh, you know, it was just kind of accepted that people go to church and believe in God. And, and everybody pretty much believed there was some kind of God. But we've come a long way from that. And, uh, and I think our need to go out and preach the gospel more is going to become paramount in the coming years. People don't just go to church anymore. Uh, Christians go to church. And so a lot of times I'm up here preaching to the choir, right? Uh, preaching to people who already know the gospel message for the most part. But there's a lost and dying world out there that says, I will never set foot in a church. And as a result, we need to find ways of going out and ministering to them. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. But I, I want our church to really start thinking about ways that we can go out not assume that lost people are going to come through those doors, hear a message, and uh, give their lives to Jesus. It just doesn't happen that way as much anymore. We have got to be a church that goes out into the streets and proves that love that we say that we have. And so we'll talk about that more in the, in the coming months. And not only that, but who was also chosen by the churches to travel with us, uh, travel with us with this gift, which is administered by us to the glory of the Lord himself and to show your ready mind. And so uh, they really feel uh, very highly uh, about this guy. Uh, we don't know anything about him. Isn't that interesting? There's some people whose names are written in the Bible and, and for all of time in memoriam, we, we know that person's name. But there are so many in the church over the last 2,000 years, you never heard their name before. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of people in the last 2,000 years that have been diligent and chosen and worked hard their whole lives and their name is never known. And maybe that's you, maybe that's you, but the Lord recognizes and, uh, and appreciates the service that you have given towards him. And it's not about our name, it's about his name. As it says there at the end, uh, to the glory of the Lord himself. To the glory of the Lord. And so this guy was chosen by the churches. They said, hey, we trust this guy. We see this guy as not only diligent 
and hardworking, but he's honest. We trust him. We know he's not going to take all that money and abscond with it and head out of town. We know he's trustworthy. And so there's that aspect of it as well. Um, <laughs> talking about the gospel, I don't know if you guys have seen this at all, but uh, I've done three of these weird things now. Uh, on YouTube, there's a thing called uh, reactions, right? Where somebody who's like an opera singer is reacting to Metallica, <laughs> heavy metal song or something, you know? And, and it's kind of interesting to see their reactions to certain kind of music. And I got the idea, you know, I could use that as a means of preaching the gospel to people who listen to Pink Floyd and Rush and Black Sabbath and all that kind of stuff. Uh, people would never come through these doors, but maybe I can talk about the music they like and, and see some, uh, some Christian perspectives maybe. Uh, and, and so I've been looking at different songs on these videos with a pastor's perspective on classic rock. Some, some rock songs make a statement, hey, this is truth, and uh, a lot of rock music is not, uh, but some songs, you know, they have that element of this is what we believe to be true. And so I'm looking at those songs with, a, with an examination to determine, is that a biblical truth? Does that comport with biblical truth, or does that uh, coincide with biblical truth, or is that not uh, a biblical truth? And so I've just done a couple of them, and uh, I'm getting some reactions myself, uh, especially on this one. This is the one I just finished. And boy, when I started picking on Pink Floyd, whew, people, actually, I agreed with the song. The song is great. It talks about how wasting time and, and uh, wasting our lives away and those kind of things. And, uh, and so I really... Uh, you know, use scriptures to talk about wasting time and, you know, that your life is just like a flower. It, it blooms and then it fades away and then that's it. And, and so I began to feed scripture into that as a means of, of, of drawing people to faith and, and, and speaking uh, scripture into their lives in, in a way that they had never heard before, maybe. And again, I'm getting some strange reactions, and I, I got this one point here. Uh, to a person who's not inclined to presuppose a deity, this feels terribly weird. <laughs> I thought it was just crazy that somebody would say that. But again, it gives you uh, an insight into the world today. Most people have presupposed a deity over the years, but there are a lot of people out there now that are just hardcore atheists, and the gospel message to them is just weird. Why are you, oh, why are you doing this? Why are you messing with my music? Why are you talking about, you know, Pink Floyd and talking about the Bible? That's weird, you know, and they're just, they're upset about it. But then I'm able to respond back to them, and I'm able to have a little bit of a dialogue with them, and I share scripture with them. And, and so it's kind of a personal uh, way of, of sharing the gospel with people who are never going to come through those doors, ever. And so, um, you know, that's one way, you know, but is there, are there other ways that we can actually go out and minister to people out there uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ and actually, again, show our love? to them in a tangible way. Uh, he keeps on going there. He says, avoiding this. You know, again, he's talking about taking this offering down to these people, and he talks about it being a lavish offering, a lavish gift. But he said, we want to avoid something here. We want to avoid this, that anyone should blame us in this lavish gift, which is administered by us. Uh, and so we've got these three very... Uh, well thought of guys uh, who are respected in the churches, all of the churches around here, and uh, they're honest men, they're diligent men, they're chosen men that all of the churches agree we can trust them to take this money down. Because it is such a lavish gift. It's a lot of money is what Paul's saying. And uh, we know we can trust these three guys to take it down there. And, and you know, it begins to speak to us in the church about uh, just keeping our, uh, ourselves honest and not having any show of, of evil or any um, uh, sense of improprieties going on with money. You know, we're very open about that. If anybody wants to see the books, you know, as long as they've been coming for a while and are tithing themselves and, 
and feel like they you know want to see the books we're we're free to offer that to anyone um, and let people know you know last week we talked about a gift that we're sending over to a ministry and, and all those kind of things you know we have to be above board on all that kind of stuff because of course the church has shot themselves in the foot over and over and over again over the years with pastors, you know, absconding with all the money and, you know, living lavish lifestyles. What it was, the PTL Club, you know, Tammy and Jim Baker. I remember back in the 70s, they had a doghouse that cost $70,000. I mean, come on. That was people saying, I want to support the ministry of God. Here's my, you know, $20 a month or $30 a month. And the pastor or this guy, this televangelist is buying $70,000 dog houses with their money. I mean, you know, those kind of things have happened over the years. And so we just have to be above board. We have to have a board of elders that are trustworthy men that are diligent in their service to the Lord. And uh, yeah, absolutely. And so we've got a great board here like that. I remember uh, several years ago now, there was a church up the road. I won't mention who it was, but uh, the pastor just decided he didn't need a board anymore. And he just kind of, well, yeah, I don't need to have elders hold me accountable. And before you know it, he started giving himself little raises here and there, and started buying things with money from the church. And before you know it, when he finally got caught, uh, it was like $240,000 in one year that he had added on to his salary. And uh, they finally said, well, we'll let you keep that money, but you're going to have to pay taxes on it. <laughs> so that was not a fun uh, tax plan there. But um, again, you know, we need to avoid those kind of issues in the church. We need to hold each other accountable and be held accountable. And uh, it's not a fun thing. You know, these are the kind of things that I, I told you when I started the book of Second Corinthians. I just thought, why is this book even in the Bible? He's dealing with these weird practical little things here. But man, the, the amount of knowledge that we gain from these things in the church and, and ways of ministering in the right way are, are just tremendous. And so we're seeing a lot of things here uh, in these two chapters like that. Providing honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. And so it's one thing, you know, that the Lord knows that we're being uh, honest about things and above board about things, but we need to do that in the sight of men as well. So there's no question, and there's no questioning of the ministry. Uh, as a result of ministries, you know, doing things with money that's uh, below board, you know, what happens? Hey, we're not going to listen to these folks anymore. We're not going to give to this church anymore. And as a result, the, the ministry crumbles and, uh, and, well, it should if it's doing those kind of things. And so um, moving on from there, I love what Pastor Epi Meyer says. Those who handle the gifts of the church should be extremely careful that all their financing be above the slightest suspicion. The apostle shrank from handling these gifts himself, lest any, uh, lest any should insinuate that he was appropriating them to his personal use. Even when we have no reason to accuse ourselves, in the sight of the Lord, we should be careful of appearances in the sight of men, and whatever is entrusted to us should be administered by us to the glory of the uh, God. And so uh, a great exhortation there as well. Uh, interesting, though, you know, we can do so much for the Lord, and this uh, study was done back in 1976 about how much it costs to actually take donations and help people. You know, from the time somebody donates that dollar to the time it gets to the needy people that need that money, uh, how much money has to go into that? How much money is taken away from that one dollar? And so the study, it's interesting. For every dollar reaching the needy, the sick, the underprivileged child, and the aged adult, the average cost of channeling it through the church is just eight cents. Again, 1976. The cost of channeling it through the federal government is $3. <laughs> For every $1 that's donated, the federal government has to add two just to get it out to the people. And, uh, and, and so you see there that, you know, the church is very efficient in taking care of the needs of people because almost all of the money goes towards that effort if 
if the church is above board, if there are diligent people in charge of it, if there are trustworthy people, if there are chosen people uh, behind those operations. Not a Judas Iscariot kind of characters who are holding the money bag, right? And so uh, diligence is what he gets into then in the last couple verses there. Diligence. And we have sent with them our brother whom we have often approved, uh, often approved diligent in many things. And so here's the third guy that's being discussed. And uh, see how many times Paul uses this term diligent to describe him. We've sent this other brother whom we have often proved diligence. And so it's not just a one-time thing. We've proved him diligent on many occasions. Uh, as we put him in charge of things, he's proved himself to be diligent. But now much more diligent because of the great confidence which we have in you. And so it's just the idea, hey, when we send him down there, we know that he's going to be proven diligent once again. And so uh, Second Peter talks about diligence a lot. It's a, it's a word that's being used in the Bible quite a bit. I love it when uh, my wife and I were homeschooling our kids at points in our marriage. Uh, we use that word a lot. Hey, come on, be diligent. Be diligent. Do your work. Make sure you're diligent. We, we just hammered that into our kids' heads. And uh, I think it's such a great word, but it's used in the Bible often because of the power of it. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, is what uh, Peter tells us. Uh, he goes on, uh, well, actually in Hebrews 11.6, it says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him, God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, first of all, faith, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, those who diligently go after him with all their hearts and give themselves completely over to him. That is what the Lord sees worthy of reward for. And so, uh, again, uh, last two verses here. If anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. If anybody wants to know about this guy, Titus, I will vouch for him. He's my partner in the faith. He's my fellow worker in the faith. He and I are like this, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I totally have no reservations about saying he's, he's uh, my partner and fellow worker concerning you. And then he, he talks about, he's also vouching for these other two guys. Or if our brethren are inquired about, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. They are messengers from the churches, and I vouch for them as well, because they represent the glory of Christ. Uh, Luke, this is a verse I quoted earlier, Luke chapter 16, verse 10. Jesus talking about being faithful, being diligent. He says, for uh, he is... He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you, uh, to your trust, the true riches? And I think that is uh, fantastic. Because really what it points to is ultimately the, uh, the, the true riches of the kingdom of God. Uh, and the whole idea about if you're faithful in this life, then you'll be rewarded in the next life in, in many ways and be given crowns and those kind of things. But um, it's just the little things, you know, that we're faithful about. I remember there's a, a guy that I used to fly with in the Navy. And he was a young kid. He had been my, my student at one point. Uh, and then we were both in another command and we were flying together, but he was quite a bit younger than me. And uh, one morning we had a very early brief in the morning. I think it was like five o'clock in the morning or something crazy, you know, and he's a no-show. He's my second crewman. He's my, he's my rescue swimmer for the day. I'm the crew chief. He's the rescue swimmer. And uh, he's a no-show for the brief. And the pilots are mad, you know, they're like, you better find him and get him here, you know, so trying to get a hold of him. Finally, he shows up, and he looks terrible. He looks like he's out been drinking all night long, and, and uh, just, you know, he looked awful, and he's late. And so I, I took him over in the corner, and I, you know, chewed him out first, <laughs> and then I shared this verse with him. 
I read this verse here right out of the Bible. I had my Bible in my bag at the time, and I just, I said, look at this verse, and this is what Jesus said, and I read it to him. He said, be faithful in the little things, and in your career later on, you'll be given bigger responsibilities. And I said, you're not being faithful right now. And he, you know, he kind of looked at me like, yeah, okay. <laughs> but a couple of years ago, he reached out to me through Facebook. And he said, you know, I never forgot that. I never forgot what you said to me that morning, that brief. And that always bugged me. And he said, now I'm a Christian, and I just really appreciate you giving me that, that, uh, that word that you gave me so long ago. And it was just really cool. You know, sometimes you get those returns, and uh, people telling you later they appreciate those kind of things. But again, it's just about this idea of being faithful. Be faithful in the little things and the Lord is going to reward you with true riches, he says. And so the last verse, verse 24, therefore, again, show to them, show to that church uh, in Corinth, show to all the churches up there in Macedonia and Thessalonica and the Bereans and and all these churches that have trusted you with this money and, and show to them the proof of your love. Show to them you're not just all talk and no action. Show to them there's a deep abiding faith at work in you. And so taking up this offering is not something that should be uh, grumbled against, you know. Uh, I think in chapter 9 he begins to talk about, you know, give with a cheerful heart. It should be given with a cheerful heart and not a begrudging heart. But show them that you truly do have love in your heart. Um, and uh, next week we'll get into uh, what was going on in Jerusalem and how, why they were poor and those kind of things. But uh, they are in need. They're in desperate need. And all the churches are coming together to provide for them. And it's a beautiful thing to see this, this idea of proving your love. And so we here in our church, how can we prove our love to this community? It's one thing to say, isn't it? It's one thing to say, hey, we love you in the love of Christ. We want you to come to faith in Jesus Christ. But how can we prove it to them? I want to challenge you to be thinking about that. Be thinking about that. Be praying about that. And, uh, you know, at the end of the summer, uh, we're going to really talk about how we can do more of those kind of things uh, in, in reaching out to this community that we're in. We've tried some things in the summer, but it, it's hard to do because people are just traveling and on vacation, those kind of things. But um, again, proof, proof of love. How can we do it? How can we do it in this church? How can you do it in your own life? Uh, you know, maybe that's going to take the form of how can you serve your family better? You know, maybe you've got some kids that uh, don't know the Lord or don't want to know the Lord or those kind of things. How can you show them, hey, all these years I've been talking about Jesus, how can you show them that you really, truly love them and that you have a love of Christ dwelling in your heart? That's a challenge for all of us, isn't it? It's not easy. Sometimes it's easier just to run your mouth and say things, but it's a whole other thing to actually prove it. And so uh, we're going to end with that. Uh, Father, we just thank you for your word here today. Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to study it, Lord, and, and just to be washed by it, to be cleansed by it, to be challenged by it. But, Father, it, it's a whole other thing to go and do it. And so we ask, Lord, again, that you would pour out your spirit on each one of us, that we may have a desire not to just talk about you, and to speak about you and to read about you, but to actually go out and be an ambassador of Jesus Christ for this lost and dying world that we're living in. We praise you for these things, Lord. We thank you for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.